I'll call the ninth regular meeting of the 2016-2017 Common Council to order. Would the clerk please read the quote for the day? Thank you, Mayor. A person that feels appreciated will always do more than expected. Thank you very much. Would the clerk please call the roll for attendance? There are 15 present. Um, Alderman Jose is excused. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Next, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I would move to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Those minutes are before us. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. There are no resignations tonight. We'll move on to mayor's appointment, city attorney. There's one appointment. Uh, the mayor hereby submits the following appointment for your confirmation to the mayor's neighborhood leadership cabinet, uh, Penny Weber. Now, does that lie over? Lies over. Okay, that will lie over till our next meeting. Next, we'll move on to our program for the evening. Uh, Marinette County experience with opiates and heroin presented by Judge Kent Hoffman, Branch 2 Circuit Court Judge. Uh, judge Hoffman came to Sheboygan from Marinette County where he had a distinguished 16-year career as a state public defender handling juvenile uh, cases, homicide cases. And since 2009, he served as the district, assistant district attorney in Marinette County. Kent's a, a Sheboygan County native, and we're happy to have him back home. Kent? Well, thank you, and thank you uh, for letting me or asking me to uh, address you this evening. Um, the Uh, as the mayor said, I am uh, the new uh, Sheboygan County Circuit Court judge, actually not the newest because Dan Borowski was just sworn in this morning. So I've been on the bench six weeks and I'm no longer the newest uh, uh, judge, which is uh, a little strange, but, uh, uh, but it's great to be home. Um, I was asked to uh, speak to you tonight about uh, my experience and the county of Marinette's experience with the heroin issue up there. Um, and a as the uh, mayor said, I was uh, actually 10 of the years I was in the public defender agency, I was heading up the Peshtigo office, which was Marinette County. And then uh, for seven and a half years, I was in the uh, district attorney's office up there. I was the assistant district attorney, and I was uh, pretty much exclusively, well, not exclusively, but uh, a big part of my role was uh, the drug prosecutions. I handled all, all the higher end uh, uh, drug prosecutions. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Marinette County, uh, it's roughly about 41,000 people in total. Uh, Marinette, the city of Marinette, and the city of Menominee, Michigan, are basically one city divided by a river. Those two encompass roughly about 21,000 people, and Peshtigo is just to the west. Uh, it's about another 5,000. So in that metropolitan area there, you have roughly about 25, 26,000 people. Uh, starting in about 2007, uh, we had a couple high school girls, 18 years old, uh, who got caught... Uh, bringing heroin back uh, to Marinette County for distribution. They uh, were prosecuted and uh, were actually sent to prison. Uh, that was Marinette County's, uh, the first time, at least in all the years I was up there, that we heard anything about heroin. And that was roughly 2007, 2008. During that time, um, uh, well, in the, in the years just after that, 2009, 2010, we started seeing a real increase in heroin cases. And um, if you look at the statistics, and the statistics I'm going to give you tonight are ballpark figures. I didn't have a chance to, to fact check them and research them, but they're pretty accurate. Um, if you look at 2009, 2010, maybe 2011, for the state of Wisconsin, 
um, the heroin submissions to the crime lab for testing, either through deaths or possessions or uh, possession with intents to deliver um, or deliveries of heroin, um, Milwaukee was number one. I think it was Racine or Kenosha was number two, something right down there. And then Marinette way up in northeast Wisconsin. Well, how'd that happen? You would have thought that um, the progression of heroin would have maybe traveled up either the 41 or the 43 corridor on its way up to northern Wisconsin, but um, 41,000 people, and we were third in the state for uh, the number of submissions for testing in those kind of cases. Um, and it turned out, it, um, I, and I think a lot of the professionals up there would agree, uh, there was a doctor... Um, uh, who was essentially what we call a pill mill. Uh, he was prescribing anything for very cheap, uh, and um, he was actually federally prosecuted for that in roughly about 2008, 2009, maybe even a couple a year or so earlier. Went to federal prison, and uh, he w could no longer practice up there. Um, and uh, when that happened, he had been prescribing opiates, drug uh, painkillers, uh, things of that nature, for, for anyone at a very cheap price. When his practice was shut down because of that and he was sent to federal prison, that's when we saw heroin arrive in Marinette County. So uh, that's how we think that the link happened, that it didn't kind of follow a pattern up. It just went from Milwaukee area right up to Marinette. Marinette being 41,000 people, we weren't really equipped to deal with it. Um, we, um, law enforcement's response was very good. Um, we had a lot of, um, a lot of cases. Um, I spent probably, um, I would estimate my average work week was probably about 60 hours. Um, and of that, I was spending probably 30 to 35 hours as a prosecutor. Um, so at least half my time, if not more, on drug cases, uh, much less all the other cases we were, we were dealing with. Um, law enforcement's response, uh, we were real aggressive. Um, we Initially, we, the dealers were actually coming to Marinette, setting up for a day or two, and then selling their stuff and going back to wherever they were coming from. Um, they then, because of the sentences we were giving, uh, in part, uh, and maybe some other reasons, the uh, practice switched from them coming up there to the people from Marinette who wanted the drugs going to either Milwaukee or Chicago or places to get it and bring it back. Um, the, um, um, I even went so far as to uh, when we were able to identify uh, drug dealers in Chicago who were dealing in the Marinette area, and by that I mean who the people from Marinette were traveling to to get the drugs. If they were a major source, we actually uh, I actually charged them in Marinette County with party to a crime of the delivery up there or the possession with intent to deliver up there when those individuals were caught, um, um, even though they had never stepped foot uh, in Marinette County. Um, and what we found, we were very aggressive with our, our prosecutions. It was not unusual that we were getting five years or more on these types of cases as far as confinement time sentences. But we also found at the same time that the, the, that, that didn't uh, in and of itself uh, take care of the issue. Um, the problem continued to grow up there as it did then statewide. We are no different than anywhere else. I think everywhere in Wisconsin now has a heroin issue. Um, we were just hit with it early because of the, uh, ex the reasons I said earlier. Um, being a rural county, we had no treatment options. Um, uh, and when I say we, I mean uh, at the time I was working in Marinette. Um, no real treatment op options. Uh, there were no inpatient facilities anywhere near there. The treatment providers that we did have were ill-equipped or not equipped to uh, handle opiate addictions, and um, that was something we uh, really needed to, uh, to integrate uh, into our approach. Um, the, um, while the law enforcement uh, presence and, and um, intervention and the prosecutions were good, we were finding that the, the more it seemed as we were taking someone off the street for dealing, uh, two or three people were replacing that individual. 
Um, and so we really had to expand our approach uh, to kind of uh, deal with the issue. Um, community awareness was a big part of that. Uh, we handled, uh, we held numerous uh, presentations uh, in the community to make parents, to make people aware of the issue, um, and um, that was a big part of it. Um, treatment options, that was something we, we really needed to get going as well. As I said, we had no local treatment. Parents were frustrated because they'd see their children, uh, children by that, I mean 16 to 20 years old, involved in the heroin uh, trade or in usage, and they had nowhere to turn. Uh, they had no treatment providers or anything like that. So um, many of you may have heard of John Nygren. He is a state representative from up there who happens to be a, a co-chair of the Joint Finance Committee. He actually had a daughter uh, who I prosecuted and sent to prison for possession. And the reason I recommended a prison sentence, and, he, and he's very open about this. He's been very influential in developing some of the programs at the state level uh, attacking the opiate and heroin issues. Um, but the reason I recommended prison in her case is I, I had uh, local treatment had been tried and it failed, uh, in part because we didn't have the right types of treatment. Um, and uh, I basically recommended prison, and the judge gave her prison in order uh, to save her life. Uh, and that was um, uh, uh, an example of uh, not having the resources uh, in a small area uh, set up. So it hit, it hit early, it hit hard, and uh, we weren't really at that time set up with it. The other thing I'd note is uh, heroin is not just a low income issue, uh, it hits all walks of life. Um, uh, I have seen and prosecuted people who are working at the shipyard there making very, very good money um, and, um, and they still fell into the, the addiction uh, cycle with it. Um, in in Marinette County, um, we were averaging probably about one heroin overdose death every month. Now remember, this is only a county of 41,000 people. Um, it got to the point where when I'd read an obituary in the paper, um, um, if the person was under 40 years old, I assumed it was an overdose. I mean, that's, that's how common it was. Um, it was that doesn't mean it was an overdose. That was just the assumption in my mind, seeing uh, the age of the person who had died. Um, so uh, we really saw the need, I think, to uh, expand beyond uh, just the law enforcement approach, but to make it a kind of an integrated, collaborative community effort. Uh, and that involved um, uh, certainly the aggressive uh, law enforcement, aggressive prosecutions, but getting grants, uh, building treatment uh, options and programs through our human services department, through some of the other providers up there. Uh, community approach, um, going into the schools, uh, particularly the officers, uh, talking about uh, with the kids, the young kids, about uh, drugs and about those issues. Um, um, and um, uh, the other thing, the other thing we did um, as well is one of the big things we started, which Sheboygan's now starting, was a drug court. And uh, we found that to be, um, it's only about two years old, so I'm kind of, uh, I didn't um, see it. Uh, well, I, I was one of the founders or founding members of the court up there, um, but I did find that that's a very effective tool uh, to help um, to, uh, tool to help address the problem. It wasn't, um, it, it's not gonna solve it, uh, but for the people who are in it, it works, and it works very effectively if the right persons are put into it, and there's studies that show who does best with uh, that uh, type of a program. The other thing we saw developing in Marinette County uh, as a result of that was that the recovery community, um, which would be uh, your NA um, community, people who have been through the addiction and, and fought it and are still fighting it, uh, but who are involved with the NA programs uh, or similar programs, um, that that really got um, uh, the recovery community be, uh, got solidified and really um, kind of um, got energized uh, by the drug court, and uh, um, and I think it's it's made our recovery community a lot stronger, which has really helped the people who are currently going through it uh, in their in trying to break that addiction cycle. So it very much was a we found it it took a collaborative uh, effort. Um, uh, you know, law enforcement, prosecution, um, 
and um, um, uh, but these other programs as well, uh, particularly educating the community and providing those treatment options. Um, the um, other thing we found is that the employers in Marinette County, and, and I should have added, uh, in about 2013, uh, Marinette County was actually, or the city of Marinette, was actually written up twice in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I wish I could tell you that was for their shipbuilding industry or something like that, but it specifically had to do with the heroin issue. Uh, that's how, that's how, that, uh, how bad it was up there. Uh, now, again, that has gone statewide, um, but um, it's not the way any community wants to make uh, the Wall Street Journal, certainly. Uh, but that um, shows you how early they were hit there. And um, uh, the article uh, in the Wall Street Journal really talked about the employers uh, in the community and how they stepped forward uh, because they want, uh, they were having problems either keeping employees because of uh, the drug addictions or get, being able to hire them in the first place uh, because they couldn't pass uh, the test. Um, so the employers, uh, one thing we found was the employers locally were really willing to step up uh, and help with uh, addressing the need uh, for, for these various aspects that I talked about. So um, um, I guess just to kind of summarize, uh, the heroin uh, for years, well, it, heroin was a big drug a long time ago, um, and then it, you, you never heard of it. In my early years of practicing, um, we'd see cocaine, we'd see marijuana, but we'd never see heroin, and then suddenly it, it came back. Um, and the potency today of the heroin is a lot stronger than what it was back in the 60s and 70s when that drug was popular. Uh, and one of the risks with heroin and the reason you see so many deaths with it is the potency of it on the streets varies so much. It can, it can vary from day to day, uh, and that's why there's such a high risk of, of overdose and overdose, de overdose deaths uh, with it. So um, the other thing, I, uh, um, um, again, it hits all walks of life. Uh, I think the legislature has really made some, some good moves lately to, um, uh, in the last few years, uh, to address some of these, uh, as we call them, pill mill operations, uh, to address um, some of the um, treatment needs, in, uh, particularly in smaller uh, communities. Um, I just want to finish uh, with this uh, quote out of one of the articles. Uh, it says, in 2013, more Wisconsinites died as a result of drug overdose than from motor vehicle crashes, suicide, breast cancer, colon cancer, firearms, influenza, or HIV. And that was a, according to a report released uh, by the Department of Health Services uh, that was released in 2015. Um, the, um, um, there were approximately... Uh, from uh, 2000, in 2013 statewide, there were 843 drug overdose deaths. And um, that, uh, I think, heroin uh, contributed to uh, well over a quarter of those, if not more. So um, uh, those are just some of my thoughts, uh, my experiences with, um, uh, with the heroin issue from when I, I worked and practiced and lived in Marinette. And um, um, it, um, uh, you know, I think really the collaborative effort they've uh, taken up there has really been been helpful. Again, it's not a solution. Uh, everyone statewide is fighting uh, fighting this. It's not just up there. Um, it hits all walks of life, as I said. Um, but um, that's, uh, I think, anyone. If you talk to anyone, any of the professionals from Marinette involved, um, they'll uh, they'll agree with that uh, that assessment that it really takes a, a collaborative approach. The other thing we did too, I should mention, is we um, we um, <clears throat> got involved very early with uh, the medical community and uh, got them educated um, about. Uh, prescription overdose and opiates and things like that. And the legislature has actually um, uh, taken some steps in legislation in the last few years to address um, uh, these pill uh, issues as well. So to make sure that the people who are, who 
are, are using them and are getting the prescriptions actually need them, that they're not just uh, feeding an addiction. So uh, those are my thoughts. I'll, I'll stick around. I'll be here till after the meeting. So if you have specific questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. I'm also in branch two. Um, you know, if you ever want to talk about this a little further, um, you know, feel free to, to stop in or call me there. So. Kent, thanks for joining us today and sharing your experience in Marinette County, and welcome back to Sheboygan. Thanks. Nice to be back. <laughs> Next item is public forum. City Clerk. Yes, the first on the list will be Delcy Johnson. Delcy, can I have your home address, please? 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. And you will have five minutes. Mayor Vandersteen, City Clerk Richards, City Attorney Adams, Aldermen, and citizens. I am here to present my annual State of the City's Ambulance Service Report. <clears throat> the information I will share with you is based on data received in an FOIA request to Finance Director Nancy Bust for expenses and revenues related to the operation of the ambulance service in 2015. Operating three ambulances 24-7 requires 21 firemen, but the ambulance budget only includes salaries and benefits for the four newest hires. Salaries and benefits for the four firemen was $316,248. Salaries and benefits for 17 additional firemen would be $1,344,054. EMS calls accounted for 77% of the incidents that the department responded to. 77% of $1,344,054 is $1,034,922. Total expenses were $1,640,442. This includes $8730 for leasing the ambulances and $118,541 for contracted billing services. Total billings were $2,964,162. Actual collections were $1,323,385, or 45% of billings. Subtracting expenses from revenues results in a loss of 317057 Also in 2015, the city paid forward $586,018 for replacement ambulances, but did not take possession of them until this year. The cost of the ambulances will continue to be part of the yearly ambulance budgets. So, I have calculated a loss of $317,057 in 2015. However, the loss would be much greater if administrative costs and the higher salary and benefit costs for the 17 additional firemen were included. The amount calculated for the firemen is based on the salary and benefits for each of the new four for each of the four newest hires, which was $79,062. But the average salary and benefits of the 17 additional firemen would be higher than that base figure. Also, the figures do not include any administrative costs. It takes more than four men and an ambulance to operate the service. Deputy Chief Butler was hired late in 2007 to run the ambulance service and is identified in the 2013, 2014, and 2015 annual reports as Deputy Chief EMS slash Safety Emergency Management. But his salary and benefits are not included in the ambulance budget. 
I did not seek salary and benefit figures for the administrative personnel, but if those costs and the higher salaries and benefits for the 17 firemen were added, the actual cost of providing ambulance service would be much higher and the loss much greater. Fond du Lac, which operates three fire stations, includes administrative costs. They include 50% of the salaries of their fire chief, three assistant fire chiefs, an administrative assistant, a records clerk, and 75% of the salaries of their paramedics. At the time the city decided to take over the ambulance service, a story in the Sheboygan Press on May 30, 2007 noted, and I quote, if the service loses money, city fire officials will cut the department's budget to make up the loss. End of quote. Of course, it's easier to avoid that situation when you don't count all your expenses. In 2015, the department responded to 77 building fires with five stations. That's 1.3 calls per station per month. In closing, I commend Chief Romas for dealing with the reality of the need to reorganize the department. He chose not to replace three of the seven 2015 <coughs> retirees. Of course, the fire union is protesting the chief's decision. Their usual mantra is, minutes matter. Yet, interestingly, a large number of firemen do not live in the city, but depend on volunteers to protect their families and property. Evidently, minutes don't matter if you are a fireman living outside the city. Thank you. Thank you, Delsey. Next on our list is Mike Brunette. Mike, can I have your home address, please? 1925 South 26th Street. And you will have five minutes. All right. Um, didn't plan on mentioning this part, but I'll move on a little on um, Judge Hoffman's heroin dealy. The other day I was looking at uh, what looked like a repainting of North Avenue and I met a guy who I'll call the Snoid because that's who R. Crumb referred to him as and he was telling me about that the first undercover police officer in Sheboygan County was actually hired to work on heroin cases. And when you talk about heroin and like you said there was a drug mill and would be a reason for it. In the United States, we have this big uptick, and if you look at Forbes, you have the Sackler family, which is now one of the richest families. They get to look down at the Rockefellers and other families like that because they're so rich. What do they sell? Oxycontin, that new drug Oxycontin, the one that the Fed said is not addictive now, so that's cool, you can sell it now. It was developed in War, World War I by the Germans, and it was shelved basically, because it was addictive. But in my opinion, and I'm no expert, according to the Chamber of Commerce, in a tweet, I'm one of the two stupidest people in Sheboygan <coughs> County, which is pretty impressive, but it's like, I think that has a lot to play with it, that so many people are getting those drugs. Different topic now, um, Sheboygan made the national news again, a middle-class stronghold's uncertain future, the Atlantic. And as incomes fall across the nation, even better off areas like Sheboygan, Wisconsin are faltering. Read it. Um, all right. And moving on, it came to my attention, and not to expect anybody to ask me anything, but when you're giving up a lot of information and stuff, you'd think sometimes somebody would ask a question. But I was told that the reason that nobody calls on people who come up and speak is that they were instructed that you're not allowed to, and I'm going to ask the city attorney, is that true? In, or, or unless you actually say at the end, do you have any questions? Is that the case? Are, are, are people on the council al allowed to call on whoever they want, or is that restricted? No, we're just he listening to your presentation. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking when you're undertaking things later on, you call on department people. You call on people to answer questions, but you never, ever call on anybody. And I'm, I'm asking the city attorney because that would be his 
deal, but I'm to, I mean, I know you're just listening to my presentation right now. I understand that. I mean, I could be talking to the wall for all practical purposes. But moving on, we'll mention the art, recent article in the press on City Hall. And it's mentioned, the reason that we're doing, oh no, we're working on it behind closed doors. Okay, you're working on closed doors because you're negotiating. I obviously missed something in the minutes and stuff because I can't understand what would be being negotiated on because no, I, I have not seen anything that would be at that level of negotiations. I mean, you, there's nothing there decided by the city council, whether we're going to keep a new one or an old one, where we're going or whatever. I don't understand what negotiations could possibly be happening. And if that's the case, those meetings should be open. I say they should be open anyways. And moving on to that same subject, you have that signs all above, give us your input, give us your input. Then you have this dinky little questionnaire asking a few questions, and it's like, whoop-de-doo, who cares? And it's like, bottom line is, you don't want anybody's input. That's why you do it all behind closed doors. And, okay, mo moving on, and it's like, and, like t tonight, and not that, I mean, it's boilerplate stuff. You approved um, bonding tonight at the meeting just before this, and I'm, I know it's all legal and whatever going through it, but it's kind of odd that we had to wait five minutes here because you're literally voting on something that the council's about to vote on, as if they were informed on this. And, and it's like, and it's on there, you know, okay, you know, accept and, accept and ad adopt and pass resolution. But it's like, it literally just got voted on. How would you would know that that was even going to be approved? Um, and on, okay, another thing from the other finance meeting the other, uh, other day, l last week, and it's like a few little things on there, like all the savings that we're having from not having the city assessor's office in-house now, where they're actually in this building, and I assume using the same equipment and whatever, and it's like in the savings just aren't there. Excuse As, me, Mike. Your five minutes are up. The, the extra minute thing is no longer? Anyone want to make a motion to give them an extra minute? I'll make a motion to Second. give them an extra minute. All right. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now that I lost, oh, da, 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 da. now I got to remember where I was, and I will before the minute's up. I haven't started. Um, okay, but the city assessor's office, it was called the attention, they're looking for extra money, like somewhere around $7,200 for a part-time person, because this person makes more than the last part-time person, and the reason person makes more is they're doing IT work, they're doing Unix work, and it's like, really? That sounds like something completely different. And the other thing being in it, that you're also $80,000 different because the finance director still works here and will be here for three more months. So there's that salary. And I'm wondering, is the entire finance department still here? Or, or not finance, but the assessment department. And that's all I got because that's all I got. Thank you, Mike. Okay, that's it for this evening. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to mayor's announcements. <clears throat> Tonight, we're very privileged to have a very special person join us. This person has 48 years in public education, and I'd like Tom Desitel to please step forward. I'd like to deliver a proclamation to Tom from the Office of the Mayor in the City of Sheboygan. Whereas after 48 years in public education, the last 38 years coaching at Sheboygan North High School, Tom Desitel has retired. Des and whereas Desitel came to Sheboygan North after teaching for 10 years at Milwaukee Public School District and coaching the junior varsity at Milwaukee Madison for eight seasons, and whereas on September 27th of 2014, Coach Desitel was inducted to the Wisconsin Basketball Coaches Hall Association's Hall of Fame, where the WBCA committee did not hesitate to vote him in unanimously. And the executive director at that time said it was just unanimous because he has so much respect in the state and he's a great coach, but even a better person. And whereas while coaching at North High, Desitel has accumulated 646 wins, a state championship, 17 conference titles, 
and 21 WIAA regional championships. And whereas he also led the Golden Raiders to the WIAA state tournament seven times, including the title winning year in 1986 and runner up finish in 1993. He also posted a 70 and 26 record against crosstown rival Sheboygan South in both regular season and postseason contests. Now, therefore, I, Mike Vandersteen, as mayor of the city of Sheboygan, do hereby proclaim August 5th of 2016 as Tom Desitel Day. And at this time, I'd like to call up Alderman Bellinger for a few closing comments. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's not often we get a chance to get up here and, and speak um, about somebody that's had such a positive impact on our community. And I get to do that tonight, and I can speak firsthand because I have two sons that participated in the basketball program. I've got one that graduated in 2009 and one in 2010. And uh, my oldest son, uh, he was a little vertically challenged. He played freshman year and then decided that uh, his future in basketball probably wasn't going to be as a player, and so he moved on to become a manager. And so he worked for the varsity team and Coach Desitel directly for three years and was the manager. And uh, my other son, Charlie, while he uh, was not vertically challenged, he did have some height in the family, he uh, was challenged by his defense. And uh, Coach worked with him and, and worked on his defense, he liked to shoot the three, but he didn't really like to play defense too much. But uh, uh, Coach brought uh, that work ethic around, and, and uh, Charlie knew that if he was going to get any kind of minutes on the court, he was going to have to play defense. And uh, part of the reason that uh, I've gotten to know Tom so well also is that from about the last 10 to 12 years, I've been the treasurer of the North Boys Basketball Booster Club. And in doing so, um, having sons that participated in the program, and uh, working closely with Tom um, on, the, on the booster club finances and the, and the spending and, and the different fundraising activities that went around, I got to know Coach Desitel very well. Um, he came to North, uh, I believe, in 1977. Uh, my wife graduated in 1979, so she, you know she was one of the, the first uh, students that uh, he had a privilege to teach and, and work with. So he's, he's been part of the community and part of the fabric for years and years. And there's something about North basketball that um, if you play for them, it's a fraternity and a brotherhood and a, a, a family. They, uh, they all get along with each other, all the players, the former players. They all have um, each other's backs. There's been, unfortunately, if you've, you, you know, have this many years of service, um, you're going to have some tragedies. There's been some unfortunate uh, deaths and things like that that have occurred. And they're there for each other, and they're very proud of the accomplishments that they had both on and off the court. Uh, playing for Coach Desitel is not easy, and sometimes it's not fun, because he demands the best from each player. And um, that's the worth ethic that's instilled. So it's quite a commitment for these kids to go through North High in play for Coach Desitel because it knows they know what's in store for them. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of commitment, and uh, he demands the best. And one of the things that he does that he, or that he instilled early on at Sheboygan was uh, all the players, when, when they represent the community, when they go to uh, their games, they're to wear blue blazers just like this and ties. And uh, he wanted the, the kids that, you know, show that, uh, they respected the game, they respected the community, and uh, they, they wanted to be, you know, have a high-class organization and, and show that class. So that's something that still goes on to this day, and it's kind of a unique tradition. And um, let's see. Also, one of the things that, you know, people may not know about Coach Desitel is that he has a mentor growing up in uh, one of the best basketball coaches in the country, and that was John Wooden. Uh, Coach Desitel went out and worked some of his camps, became uh, a very close friend of his. And um, if you know anything about John Wooden, not only probably one of the best coaches to ever live, he was a better person, and uh, he wanted his players to thrive and become outstanding people off the court. 
And he, what he did was he came up with this, this pyramid of success. And uh, it's a pyramid of traits and characteristics that individuals have to have to be successful. And this happens to be one that uh, the coach got signed for my son Matthew. But uh, at the top of the, of the pyramid are three things that I think that kind of embody what the coach is all about. One is creative, a competitive greatness. And that is to be at your best when your best is needed. And then faith and patience. Coach is a man of, of great faith, and, and he's got great patience to be able to deal with these kids all these years. And um, one of the, uh, I'd like to just close by saying one of the um, uh, comments from Coach Wooden, or quotes that he's attributed to, is success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing that you made the effort to become the best you are capable of becoming. And not only is Coach, the definition of success, you just look at all his players, um, you know, his players are emulating that as well. And uh, what I'd like to do is present a sign that I had made from the Department of Public Works, and it is kind of a, uh, a unique sign, and I didn't want to just, you know, give you uh, the proclamation or something like that. I wanted to have something, you know, rather unique. Um, those that are part of the North basketball program know that the coach has his own logo that he created, and some of the some of the uniforms, the different iterations of the uniforms have the logo on it, and uh, and so there's there's that. And in working with Public Works Department, one of the sign makers down there is an Arden South fan, so uh, he did this begrudgingly. I, I don't know. He, he's, he's happy for your success and your honor. I don't, I don't know if he's happy to see you go and not have to coach against South anymore or, you know, just happy for your accomplishments. But uh, I'd like to present this to you, Coach. Now, the one thing that John didn't mention is that the reason that we selected uh, Friday as Tom Desitel Day is that there's going to be a, a North High Booster golf outing, and uh, John is going to represent these to, to Coach Desitel at that particular meeting. So I want to, again, th thank Tom and offer him a chance to say a few words. Well, I want to thank Mayor uh, Vandersteen. Uh, Mr. Bellinger brought along his wife, Mrs. Bellinger. I thank those as well. Um, after hearing the somber comments by Judge Hoffman, we need to recognize there are a lot of people that are so supportive of our uh, youth activities in the city of Sheboygan. We have a alderman who has been working years and years as a volunteer with our youth football, unrecognized. Uh, uh, for his services. We have an alderman who is never going to miss a Friday night or a Saturday football game at either north or south. Um, uh, Scott's been around supporting uh, youth athletics in our city too. The other end of the perspective painted by Judge Hoffman and a, a, certainly a scary one. Uh, I truly um, Appreciate uh, the recognition by the Common Council. You have a long meeting tonight. I understand that. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful uh, to these people for their contributions as well uh, to city government and also to uh, youth activities in our city. Thank you again so much. proclamation for tonight. Um, we need all of us to join us at National Night Out tomorrow, August 2nd, from 5 to 7 at Cleveland Park, a new location. Because of the safety of our communities depends on both the Sheboygan Police Department and the residents of Sheboygan, National Night Out is an event where neighbors across the nation in Sheboygan come together with the police department for a singular purpose to make Sheboygan someplace better. 
Please come out to the party at Cleveland Park, located at the corner of Geely Avenue and 25th Street. There'll be food trucks, entertainment, and a lot of information for you. Tonight, I'm pleased to, pre to recognize Penny Weber from the Sheboygan County Crime Stoppers Organization, who are the organizers of National Night Out. Penny, would you please come up? The City of Sheboygan Proclamation, whereas Na the National Association of Town Watch is sponsored a unique nationwide crime and drug prevention program on August 2nd, 2016, entitled National Night Out. And whereas the 33rd annual National Night Out provides a unique opportunity for Sheboygan to join forces with thousands of other communities across the country in promoting cooperative police community and crime prevention efforts. And whereas Sheboygan Countywide Crime Stoppers played a vital role in assisting all law enforcement agencies in, she in Sheboygan through joint crime, drug, and violence prevention efforts in Sheboygan County and is supporting National Night Out 2016 locally. And whereas it's essential that all citizens of Sheboygan be aware of the importance of crime prevention programs and impact that their participation can have on reducing crime, drugs, and violence in Sheboygan. And whereas police community partnerships, neighborhood safety, awareness, and cooperation are all important themes of National Night Out program. I know, therefore, Mike Vandersteen and the Common Council do all call on all citizens of Sheboygan to join Sheboygan Countywide Crime Stoppers and the National Association of Town Watch in supporting the 33rd annual National Night Out on August 2nd of 2016. I'll present this to Penny Weber. National Night Out is something that everybody can do. Uh, sometimes we wonder, can we do anything that'll make a difference? This can make a difference. This is something that across the country, it's not just cities, it's college campuses, it's military bases, come together on one night to say, we together can make a difference. And we are going to support that partnership between law enforcement and the community. Many years ago, Sir Robert Peel said, the people are the police and the police are the people, and that's very true. Each side should be held accountable. So please join us. We have our walk against crime. It starts at 630. We're going to walk through the neighborhood, and we're visually saying we are taking back our neighborhoods and we will no longer tolerate crime where we live. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny. <laughs> and one last note, uh, the survey that we were asking all citizens to consider taking, the online survey, which is available at the city website by clicking the banner ad, is gonna be extended for one week. So we have one additional week to participate. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. It'll include items 2.2 through 2.17. Alderperson Donahue. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as an initial point, I just wanted to welcome um, Ms. Johnson back to the uh, council chambers. We have missed her uh, presence. Um, I move to accept and file all reports of officers, accept and adopt all reports of committees, and pass all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. The uh, consent agenda is before us. Is there any discussion on any of the items in consent? Okay, on 215, the action was to accept and adopt. That has to be referred back to PPNS, so that will be the predetermined uh, action on that. Is there any objection to that from the motioners? 215. Okay, thank you very much. Any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll for passage? <coughs> 16 ayes. Motion passes. Moving down to reports of officers, item 3.1 through 3.7 will be referred to various committees. Under resolutions, 
4.1 is a resolution by Alderperson Donahue approving the third amendment to the WB-13 vacant land offered to purchase between the John Michael Kohler Arts Center and the city of Sheboygan. Alderperson Donahue. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as an initial uh, matter, um, I've been advised that um, there is a need for a bit of additional time for the Arts Center um, to uh, finish all of the various pieces of this uh, uh, vacant uh, land offer to purchase, uh, and it is of some urgency, which is why we are moving to suspend the rules, and I would make that motion. Second. Thank you for that motion and second to suspend. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would uh, move to uh, put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. The motion is before us. Is there any discussion? Alderman Lassard. Yes, I'm wondering if you could just um, give us a heads up as to what's different now that we have the Third Amendment. What were the changes? Chad, would you like to come and answer that question? Alderman Lassard, do you have your microphone on? I do. It's right okay, here. Okay, good. It's basically the transferring of some documents, but it's also the passing of an easement for the former South 36th Street property that the council voted to vacate at the last meeting. There's a, a property owner in the town on the north side of the tracks, and the art center is still negotiating on an easement with their attorney to get that in place before we close. So we're hoping to close these finally uh, documents, get this all wrapped up within the next 10 days, and be able to close shortly thereafter. Thank you. Any other discussion? See, now will the clerk please call the roll. <clears throat> 16 ayes. Motion passes. Item 4.2 is a resolution by Alderperson Wolf authorizing entering into a governmental agreement with the Housing Authority for IT hosting services for the Housing Authority applications. Alderman Wolf. I make a motion to accept and adopt all our ROs and accept and adopt all RCs. Second. Uh, first of all, we need suspension. I'm sorry. Pardon? We need a motion to we suspend. We need a motion to suspend I'm first. Sorry. I make a motion to suspend. Second. Thank you for that motion. And second, is there any objection to suspension? Alderman Bellinger? I'm, I'm not objecting. Again, I'd just like to know why we're suspending, what the urgency is, and for the public to be aware of that as well, if you could just clarify that. Uh, David Augustin, could you help us with that question? The reason why we need to do a suspension tonight is part of this project involves putting in fiber in the ground between the Housing Authority and City Hall. <coughs> and the window to make that happen is very small with the current equipments being on site. So that's why we want to suspend. The Housing Authority has already approved. So we just wanted to put this on suspension. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Alderman Wolf. I make a motion to pass the resolution. Second. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Fifteen ayes, one no. I'm motion. sorry. 15 eyes, one abstention. Motion passes. Items 4.3 through 4.6 um, will lie over. Items 4.7 through 4.11 will be referred to various committees. 
Under reports of committees, 5.1 is an RC by law and licensing. To whom was referred RO number 56 of 1617 by the city clerk submitting variance license applications and recommends that the beverage operator's license application 1018 be denied based on his failure to accurate review all relevant convictions on his applications, his record of violations, to the licensed activity and his record as a repeat law offender and his failure to cooperate with the committee. Alderperson Lassard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. Thank you for that motion and support under discussion. Yes, is Kevin Schultz here? Kevin was invited to our committee on two separate occasions and did not appear. And we have um, denied his license. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll for passage. Sixteen eyes. Motion passes. 5.2 is an RC by finance to whom is referred resolution number 57 of 1617 by Alderman Wolf awarding the sale of uh, 2740000 in general obligation refunding bond series 2016C and recommends that the resolution be passed. Alderman Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to accept and adopt and, and pass <laughs> resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion. And we have a second. Second. Alderman Bourne. Under discussion. Here. I would like to recommend that Carol comes up and explains. Okay. Carol, would you like to come to the front and explain this document for us and the refunding of these bonds? Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. Uh, I'm having some help there with handing out uh, the actual resolution that you will be acting upon tonight. So I'm going to go through uh, one page summary. Uh, this is a financing for refinancing existing debt. There's no what we call new money in this. This is strictly for the purpose of refinancing two pieces of debt that the city has outstanding. One was issued for TID 6 and uh, roughly 2.3 million. It's outstanding at over 4%. And the other is about 415,000. That's outstanding at about 2.27%. So what we've done is gone out to the bond market. And, uh, we prepared to do that. And in that process, we also go through a Moody's bond rating. And then we take bids from underwriters this morning and bring the results to you in the form of the resolution that is attached to this handout. So the final results is, first of all, Moody's Investor Service has reaffirmed the city's AA2 bond rating, so the very, very high bond rating. We also then took bids this morning. We received eight bids from underwriters, so the city has phenomenal uh, response in the marketplace. Uh, Sheboygan bonds are a hot commodity. So uh, we, I will show you the, the bidders. Uh, it's part of the resolution. The uh, winning bid was from the firm of Robert W. Baird. The true interest rate is 1.12%. That means that with this transaction, you are saving 252000 $776, and that's strictly for the purpose of, again, saving money. Council action on the resolution approves the borrowing terms. It awards the bonds to the winning bidder, and it locks in those interest rates. It also is giving permission to notify the bondholders of the two pieces of debt that are outstanding to let them know that on October 1, that will be the last time that they will receive an interest payment at those interest rates. So that's called authorizing the call. So that is what happens upon your action tonight if you approve the resolution. On August 25th, the city receives all the money and then we notify the, um, well, we'll notify the bondholders prior to that. 
but on October 1, then the bonds, the old bonds are completely paid off. So then you'll be paying on the new bonds that we're approving tonight. So the second page of this handout has the repayment schedule. So again, it's one repayment schedule, and the purpose is to refinance two pieces of debt. So the top part is $2,720,000. When we started the process, we were starting with $2,740,000. Because of the way the bonds were bid and the way they sold them, um, it's what's called a premium, uh, we were able to lower the amount of bonds issued to the two million seven twenty thousand. So that activity is covered in the pricing summary, and at the very, very bottom of that pricing summary, you'll see the words "true interest cost," and that's where you'll find that one point one two percent. The page following that, little detail but very important, uh, the. What this is is the savings comparison. And as I mentioned, one piece of debt was originally sold for TIF 6 projects. That's at the top of that page. So you will see the way the schedule reads from left to right. It has the calendar year, and then it has, it says 2,300,000 bonds. So out of that 2,720,000, Two million three belongs to the refinancing of TID six, and then again going to the right, you can see the TID six debt service if we did nothing, and then one more column to the right, you'll see the difference, which is savings. So the total of that column is the two hundred and forty-two thousand number. The same exercise applies to the schedule right below and that is for the TID 11 bonds. So again, 420,000 of this issue belongs to that refunding, and that compares it to the 2010 bonds and the final savings. So that's the result of uh, basically what we're voting on. And then the resolution is attached, okay? You may have seen a draft of the resolution. Well, this particular resolution has what they call exhibits attached to it which I'd like to take you to. Um, the resolution itself ends on page number nine at the bottom, and that is followed by what is called Exhibit A, and it says Official Notice of Sale. That document is what is distributed into the marketplace to solicit bidders. That's how we get the underwriters to bid. So you can see that's a four-page document. And that is followed then by Exhibit B, which is, it says, bid tabulation. Well, if you look at Exhibit B, there is the list of all the underwriters that bid this morning. So you can see the first bidder was Robert W. Baird, and there's a lot of names underneath. That's what they call their syndicate. Those are all the other firms that participated with them to submit the bid. And that's where uh, the true interest rate and the, and the costs, the net interest cost is all of the interest over the life of the issue. So that's the winning bid at the 1.112%. And then when you look down, you'll see the next bidder was Cantor Fitzgerald, Bankers Bank, and so on. So there's eight bids. So you can see they range to the high best, highest bid of a one36 that is then followed by Exhibit C. Exhibit C is the bid form. That's how they place their bids. So that's just the, um, again, the interest rates and the calculations associated with submitting the bid. That's the contract between the bidder and the city. And then Exhibit D is the, they call it the debt service or the repayment schedule, which is something we've already looked at on the first page, but in a little different format. And then it says Exhibit E, which is like a template for the bonds themselves. So um, that is the entire resolution, including exhibits. The very last page of this exhibit, I'm sorry, this resolution, it says uh, Exhibit G, which is the notice of call. So that's what we will use to notify uh, bondholders that 
they will receive their last interest payment on October 1. Carol, thank you very much for that presentation. Is there any questions of Carol? Alderman Donahue. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to point out um, there was some question as to if we're doing this sort of slinkily in the dead of night. Oh. <laughs> um, the council did approve a resolution on June 20th for this refinancing, which is, and Carol has been here before, yes. and it is always, not always, but at least in the times when we've gone forward, very financially um, uh, beneficial to the city. The reason that we met tonight yes. is that the resolution by its terms requires the sale to be on August 1st. Then tonight we can approve the sale and then get our money. So this is the process that we go through. Carol is very good at taking us carefully through all of these documents right. and finance, which is why we're a twee bit late. And, um, <laughs> And I can assure you that we're in good hands um, with this particular broker and that this is financially something um, pretty smart to be doing. Right. Thank you for those comments. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Carol, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Seeing no other discussion, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll on item 5.2 for the <coughs> funding of the bonds. Fifteen eyes, one no. Motion passes. We're going to take just a short break here to sign the documents, and we'll be right back. Job, job. Thanks. Good job. Thank okay, you. then we'll move on to item 5.3, which is an RC by finance to whom was referred resolution number 58 of 1617 by Alderman Bellinger and Bourne, creating a funding mechanism for future citywide reevaluations and recommends that the resolution be placed on file. Alderman Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to accept and adopt to file. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Sixteen eyes. Motion passes. Item 5.4 is an RC by finance to whom is referred resolution number 59 of 1617 by Alderman Wolf, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2016 budget to establish an appropriation for building inspection, part-time salaries and benefits, and recommends that the res resolution be passed. Alderman Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to make a motion to accept and adopt and, and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Fifteen eyes, one no. Motion passes. Item 5.5 is an RC by law and licensing. To whom was referred resolution number 60 of 16? Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, resolution number 60 of 1617 by Alderman Lassard establishing an updated bond schedule and recommends that the resolution be passed. Alderman uh, Lassard. Thank you. I, I wish to have, um, I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any uh, discussion on the motion? 
Alderman Lassard. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to amend the bond schedule based on a request from the Building Inspection Department to add 26-37, violation of building code, sanitation, 1 PMC 302.1, with a range of 150 to 750. The bond amount would be 150, with court cost it would be 250. Thank you for that amendment. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. The amendment's on the floor. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Then we'd be uh, looking at the um, uh, motion as amended. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? Sixteen eyes. Motion passes. Item 5.6 is an RC by finance to whom is referred resolution number 63 of 1617 by Alderman Donahue authorizing the creation of a tourism commission for a tourism zone to oversee the disbursement and spending of the city's room tax collections and recommends that the resolution be passed. Alderman Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Fifteen ayes, one no. Motion passes. Under ordinances, item 6.1 and 6.2 will refer to various committees. Number s item number seven is notice to discharge the committee of the whole. 7.1 is a notice to discharge. 5.7. Oh, I'm sorry. 5.7 will be referred to the finance committee. And then we covered uh, section six. And again, on uh, seven is a notice to discharge. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Mayor. I move to discharge from the committee of the whole. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Uh, we'll take a, 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 is there any discussion on that motion? And then what clerk, would you please call the roll for passage on the motion to discharge? Thank you. 14 ayes, two noes. Motion passes. Uh, item 7.2 is resolution number 11 of 1617 by Alderman Bellinger extending the special charge for residential garbage and refuse disposal services provided by the city. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you. I move to pass a resolution. Thank you for that uh, motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? Alderman Lassard? Yes, I wonder if you could just do a little explanation about this for me. Expending, extending the special charge for how long, et cetera. Okay, Alderman Bellinger, would you like to explain for her? Well, I would, um, I would like to make a, an amendment to this resolution, and that would clarify that. So I would move to amend the resolution to extend the charge for residential garbage and refuge disposal services provided by the city for three years and cut the rate from five dollars to two fifty per month. Thank you for that am amendment. Is there any? Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a, and a second uh, for an amendment to the uh, main motion. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Everyone understand the amendment. 
Okay, Alderman Jose. Actually, uh, my I buzzed in before, and my, my question was answered. Thank you very much, Alderman Boren. I have a I have a procedural question. Thank you, Mayor. I have a procedural question. Uh, if this amendment fails, then what happens? Is that the end of the garbage fee period, or are we going to be open for more amendments, or what's going on? Then we'd be voting on the main motion unless another amendment is made. So the main motion would be? To pass the resolution. To extend it. To extend. As is. As is. Okay. Okay, is there any other discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk's going to call roll on the amendment. Ten ayes, six noes on the amendment. Amendment passes. So now we're uh, voting on the uh, main motion as amended, and that means that uh, it would be 250 uh, per month for the next three years. Um, is there any other discussion on the motion as amended that's on the floor? Alderman Bellinger. Make a motion to pass as amended. Is there a second? Th thank you for that motion and second. Um, any other discussion on the motion? Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be supporting extending this garbage fee. And I've got some more disturbing information just from our, from our information that we got from Carol tonight regarding Moody's Investment Service. Uh, the per capita income in Sheboygan in 2011 was 52,201. 2015, it was $49,338. So our citizens are in their uh, per capita income are down almost $3,000 since 2011. And as I mentioned at the Committee of the Whole meeting, oh, one, other, one other fact <coughs> from Moody's, medium family income percent of US median for Sheboygan we're at 82.8% 82 .8 of the median family income for the country. Uh, as I mentioned at the committee of the whole meeting, the median US income uh, six or seven years ago was $56,000. And now the median income in this country is down to 52,000. So in light of that, uh, I just don't see where our constituents with getting hit by this half percent, additional half percent sales tax. Uh, we just had the wheel tax uh, I'm having a hard time renewing this fee. Uh, I think it's time for some belt tightening for the city. Uh, the fact is out there that 82% of our budget is salary and benefits. Every time we, uh, and I understand, and I mentioned this at the committee of the whole meeting, I understand that we have to pay our employees good money to maintain good employees, but every time we give a 2% increase in wages, that's another $500,000 in our budget. And uh, it's very hard to operate a city when you only have 18% of your tax levy going for needed things and 82% of it is going for salary and benefits. So I think it's time for some belt tightening in city government and I'm not gonna support renewing this uh, garbage fee. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Any other discussion? Alderman Donahue. Uh, well, as you know from the Committee of the Whole Meeting, I am a, a supporter of the garbage fee, um, both in terms of the $5 level and certainly at the $2.50 level, which is $30 a year. Uh, municipal governments have been under attack just as our citizens who are earning less money or they haven't been able to keep up because of actions by the legislature and its wisdom to limit the levy increases that we can do. I did a little research and our mill rate since 2005 has been basically identical. So for the past 12 years, we have done very, very substantial belt tightening. That has uh, involved uh, reorganization at the police department, reorganization at the fire department, reorganization at public 
uh, the, the Department of Public Works and, and also getting rid of 40 employees there. The library has uh, dramatically changed its management. So to somehow suggest that the, the city government has been unresponsive to the uh, economic needs of our, of our community, I think is just not true. And even if that were the case, even if, even if there is a, a fairly high tax burden, $30 a year is not going to make that difference. Now what it is going to do, just so we are real clear, it's taking $550,000 of income away from our city. All right? Now, our projected, if we, kept, if we had kept the garbage fee at, five, at $5 per household per month, we would have basically, without adding any new firefighters, we would have basically been able to, to balance the budget. With the, um, uh, with the elimination of essentially $550,000, because that's, you know, it's the, the, the power of numbers, that $2.50 a month translates into $550,000 a year for us. Um, with, with eliminating that, and again, without adding the firefighters, which is close to $300,000, we're looking at a $550,000 budget shortfall. Now, we have, and I think Alderman Bourne would agree, we have picked all the low-hanging fruit, we have picked the, the, the mid-fruit, and I'm not sure that we can afford a ladder to get up to the high fruit if there's any up there at all. So we just need to know that when we take this action tonight, it has consequences for us. First of all, this garbage fee, if it is taken away, can never be added back without reducing our levy, a direct dollar for dollar. $550,000 is gone and will not be recovered. So that is an important thing that we're doing here today. Now, I understand that 82% of our budget is for services, and you know why that is? So that's if my car gets broken into, I call a person at the police department who comes to help me. If my mom falls down the stairs, I call the fire department, and three burly firefighters are there to help me with my mom and provide quality care. When my children were growing up, the library was a refuge. It's a place they hung, they hung out in the adult section in the history books for hours at a time. It was a very important part of our family. I'm a tree lover. I love our trees. I know that we're going through some tough times with, with uh, the, the emerald ash borer, but the money that we give to public works keeps our trees maybe not quite as wonderful as we would hope if we had even more money, but we have beautiful parks. Come and visit us because, you know, we say, we say to relatives, we'll go to one of our parks. It's just beautiful here in Sheboygan because we have the resources to take care of things. Nobody likes to pay taxes. At the federal level and at the state level, we often just, it's like a hole, like where is the money going? How is it being used? But here in the city, I don't think of it as a tax. I think of it as a fee for services. I live here and I get all this good stuff because I pay this fee every month, or my husband and I pay this fee every month. And, and, and I get to live in a beautiful city that's very safe, crime rate going down, where one of the reasons there are so few fires is because we've done such a good job of educating people about fire hazards and, and, and installing fire alarms and things like that. So we've done a really good job at making this a beautiful place. It's like buying a house and saying, you know, this year I'm just not going to do the windows. The roof can fall in. Who needs to be painted? You know, we're, we bought this house and we're just not going to take care of it. We here as alders are charged with taking care of this house which is the city. And if the garbage fee goes away, I know $2.50 a month seems like nothing, but if you put all of that money together, it's real money and we need it. And I would suggest that if we, frankly, the thing that I am hearing from constituents and for myself is, is road repairs. You know, I've talked about kicking the can down the road. Well, the problem now is the can gets stuck in a pothole. So repairing our roads, and I know that we all got a, uh, I think most of us got a deal on our desk about, about road repairs. 
Dave Beeble has done a fabulous job of telling us just how important this work is. Now here's the deal. If we put it off because we're $550,000 short, does it get cheaper? No. $2 in 10 years becomes $6. And so we're not protecting our citizens from this $2.50. We're making sure that in 10 years, they, unless the city goes to hell because we haven't taken care of it, we're going to ensure that they have to pay more. We've put this off for a long time. We have a, a fiduciary responsibility to our constituents. It's just the way it is. And, you know, obviously, <laughs> Obviously, I feel strongly about this, but I think, that, I, I think that we need to think really carefully and thoughtfully about this and not just say, hey, it feels good to, to get rid of taxes. When Mayor Perez got elected in 2005, within 100 days, that council had gotten rid of the wheel tax and the stormwater fee management tax. Never to come back except for the wheel tax just recently. So it, it makes a difference. It takes a long time to recover from these things. We, we just can't cut off our nose to spite our face on this one. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am certainly not a fan of taxes or fees. Um, everybody knows uh, uh, the, the go around I had with the county on this incredibly innovative sales tax that they put together and you know how uh, beneficial that is to the city and how generous their contribution is to the city of $411,000. So uh, I'm not, not any fan of, of that. Um, I wasn't a fan of the wheel tax when it was originally, uh, or not the wheel tax, the garbage fee when it was originally implemented. I was not part of the council at that point in time. Um, it's been gradually decreased. Um, <coughs> Alderman Bourne was successful in putting the sunset on it last time and reducing it from $7.16 down to $5. Now we're proposing to keep it at $2.50 and putting another sunset for three years to see where we're at financially as a city. Hopefully there's a lot of uh, net new construction and new projects coming on board and the tax base is growing like crazy and, and we won't need it. But right now, um, the number one complaint I receive from any constituent is the quality or lack thereof of our streets. And um, I know that uh, David Beeble is doing a fantastic job with the resources he's giving and stretching the dollars and making it go as far as I can. Uh, the unfortunate truth about this whole thing is repairing roads and, uh, re and, and redoing roads completely is incredibly expensive. It's unbelievably expensive. So the four point seven or the $411,000 that the county so generously, generously is giving us, if you do a mill and fill with that, that's 1.6 miles of roads. Well, we've got over 200 miles of streets in the city, so that's not going to go very far. So we need to have other sources of revenue to do this. So uh, I would like to, you know, be altruistic and, and take Alderman Bourne's, you know, position and say, you know what, I'm against taxes. We need to do bell type tightening. Well, quite frankly, if we reduce this by 250 or to 250, it's going to cause us to tighten our belts anyway, and yet it's still going to leave us some revenue for roads. So I think all in all, this is a good compromise, and that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Alderman Lewandowski. I just want to say that Alderman Donahue spoke about us tightening our belts, but we are forcing the citizens of Sheboygan who we represent to tighten their belts even more. And we keep on asking the people of Sheboygan to tighten their belts, and a lot of them can't anymore. Our food pantries are running out of food because so many people are requesting it because they cannot afford some of this stuff anymore. And I would like to see this garbage <coughs> fee dropped. I know we need the money for the roads, but the people also need their money for food. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Thiel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm obviously all about tightening belts. <laughs> Little joke, sorry, I had to make, lighten up the subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not about giving up services. Um, I'm disappointed that we did vote to go down to 250. I was in favor of $5. Um, I think we made this fee, this garbage fee, about roads. 
and I think we're forgetting about our services. We, this money generally just goes to our general fund, and we get to allocate where it goes, and I think we're really forgetting that. Um, Alderman Lundowski talks about, you know, that, you know, food and stuff. Those same people are needing services. If somebody in your building goes down, our fire department ambulance services is right there for them, and they're there quick. I think of our police services with the incident on a robbery. Those people were there before that gentleman even left the building. I mean, that is unheard of, I think, in a city our size, and I commend those for that. Like I said, I'm all about tightening belts, but I'm not up to give up those type of services. Um, I'm obviously going to support the 250. I would have supported the $5 because we need it for those services. Um, for any of you who have to take advantage of those services, I think you would understand. If you haven't, you probably don't. That's why you're like, well, it's only $2.50. But for that person who needs those services, it is very important. Think of that gentleman who, who was in that bar and ended up getting shot. We had police there. We had an ambulance service there right away for that gentleman. I'm sure right now he has no issues with an extra $2.50 based on the service that he, re he received and the care that he received from our services, from our ambulance service, our fire department, and our police department. Without them, I don't think it would have been that, that successful. So I'm definitely supporting $2.50. I would have supported $5. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Heidemann. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, again, I spoke at the Committee of the Whole uh, again, this fee was one of those fees that was uh, said that it would eventually go away, and quite honestly, I'd love to see it go away. But I do see movement in that direction to where it went from five years to three years, from five dollars to two fifty. As much as I wouldn't want to support this, I am going to support it because because the end it is it's a half a million dollars. But in three years, and if I'm still here, I'm not supporting it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. The subject's been very difficult for everybody, for, against, three years, zero years, um, $2.50, $7. I just want to make sure that everybody understands the hardest part for me, and I don't like paying fees, I don't like paying increased taxes, but we have a lot of work to do to try to fix things that, as uh, Alderman uh, Donahue had said, we can't even kick the can down the street because it falls in a pothole. The concern that I have is we reduce it, it makes everybody happy for a very short period of time, and the city's going to end up having to turn around and borrow more money. So instead of having a fee that, yes, we don't agree with, that, yes, we can have a sunset, continue to try to fix things like we have been trying, we're going to end up turning around and taking out loans, taking out bonds, confusing people when we refinance. Um, but which way is, is better uh, stewardship for the city of Sheboygan? Trying to have something that has a sunset that we can try to work through and, uh, and pay off, or do we take out additional loans which we're, are gonna take us out years and years and years for even our kids to have to pay? Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I'd just like to ask the city attorney question. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, eliminating or reducing this fee. If we take action to do that, can we any time in the future go back and reverse that action because maybe we have a tough time in budgeting and we can't find enough money to, uh, to put our budget together? Um, and is the timing of that something where we could still do it uh, in, in 2016, but if we go into 2017, then, then that clock would be gone. Right. I did uh, research this issue at the uh, request of uh, our city administrator, uh, and it is my opinion that if you make the motion and approve the motion to reduce it to 50, you've done that permanently. Um, if you then next year decide you want to go back up to $5, uh, you would not be able to do that without a corresponding cut in the tax levy. Uh, so once you go down, you can't go back up. City Attorney, the other part of my question is, if we have a tough budget session as we go on and to approve that budget and say in October or November we want to add some money back to that fee, is that still open for us to do at that time or is that door shut? You could 
it, well, it depends. It depends on how far out you go. Uh, you could rescind the uh, the action of the committee or of of the council, um, but you have to follow the the procedure. You'd have to have someone uh, who made that motion uh, to to move to bring it back, um, and preferably under Robert's rules, that's done at the following meeting. So there really isn't any door other than than a short time frame two of weeks two weeks. Now. Thank you very much. Further discussion, Alderman Lassard. My question was, uh, I'm particularly in favor of keeping the garbage feed the way it was. Is there any way to, I think what you just said, we have to wait two weeks to rescind what they're doing tonight? Or is there something we can do this evening to vote on it again? Is there anything that we can do at this point not to have the $2.50, but to have the $5. Someone would have to um, make a motion to uh, reconsider the prior amendment. I would like to make that motion. Second. Wouldn't you just have, have to vote against this amendment? Yeah. And then it would have to be just somebody just who, it would have to be somebody who, who voted against this, who voted in favor of the amendment, could make a motion to basically reconsider that motion. Okay. okay, we have a motion on the floor. Wait City a second, clerk, we've already got a motion. Can, we have an amendment on the floor. City Clerk, could you please, please tell me if Alder, how Alder Person Lassard voted on the previous question on the amendment? I voted nay. Uh, just a point of clarification before we get in the weeds on this. I guess my question is this, and I was going to ask the City Attorney. So when we vote now on the motion before the body, which is to reduce the garbage fee from 5 to 250 so that is what we are voting on. If we vote no and a majority votes no, votes against this $2.50 motion, um, then the $5 stays in place. Is that true? No, okay. um, but if you vote no, uh, someone, you, you could bring a new um, motion for a different amount at some later, at some later date. But the issue is if you approve it at $2.50, now, how do you get rid of the 250 and bring it back up to five dollars? So what if the 250 loses? If the 250 loses, you right. can. That's my question. Right. So that's then, the original. then it's the status quo, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Because the it goes to the status quo, but it, it doesn't it? Uh, I believe the current um, the current fee does sunset. So it, you could defeat it. But if you don't do anything further, then the sunset clause would go into effect. So you would still need to do something to bring the fee back. Okay. This and the sunset is when? This the end of the year. End of the year. So currently we have a motion that was amended from five dollars to two fifty. That's on the floor, and that is what we're discussing right now. Now, City Attorney, can you rule as to whether or not this it, second all the amendment person is Lassard legal? Can't make that. That's correct. Can't make that motion. Okay, so that motion fails for uh, proper notification. Now we'll go on with the lights as they're blinking. Alderman Jose. Um, you know, I wasn't born yesterday, and it's obvious that you're trying to scare this 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 council into reversing the vote they just made, saying that we can't raise money some other way. In the future, I don't believe that. We just a couple of months ago passed this wheel tax that everybody's unhappy about. The county just passed a, a, a half a percent sales tax. So you're going to tell me that we can't pass another fee somewhere else if the money is really needed or have a referendum or whatever. I don't believe it, uh, city attorney. I think you're trying to scare this council into raising their vote by saying that if we, re if we lower it by $2.50, we can never go back. There's always a way to get additional money. Thank you, Alderman Jose. Moving on, Alderman Donahue. No, I, uh, that was my point okay. of clarification. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. One of the remarks you made a few minutes ago is that if we get into a tough budget period, uh, we're going to need more money. When this, when this thing was uh, initiated back a few years ago, we were told by Jim Amodio and Don Hammond and others that the garbage fee was going to be temporary and we were going to wean our way out of this over the years and we wouldn't need the garbage fee anymore. Thank God I got, an, uh, I got a sunset on it. But what you just said a few minutes ago, when times get tough, let's find more money, ways, more ways to get money out of the citizens. We've got a new city administrator, highly talented person. We've got talented people in the finance 
in the finance department. I think we've got a very talented finance committee. I don't know about the other aldermen, but if I get some scenarios where we have to cut $500,000 out of the budget, I'm gonna find the most efficient way of doing that without taking out frontline people that are facing the public every day. It's time that we cut spending. It, we've been, we, we, we're gonna be weaning off this thing for the last four years and nothing happens. It goes up by $500,000 every, $500, every year. And this year, according to Daryl, the last meeting, we haven't even be, been able to use the garbage fee this year for its intended purpose of working on the roads because we've had to fill up another $500,000 hole and by coincidence, that $500,000 is the amount that we gave in raises for our employees for 2016. So it's a never-ending cycle. We're supposed, this thing was supposed to end, and that's what we were promised, and it keeps going and going and going. And that's why I'm not supporting it. Besides, people are sitting at their dinner table in Sheboygan with $3,000 less in take-home income over the last four years, and we're asking them for more money, not only the city, but the county. It's ridiculous. I can afford it, but there's a lot of my constituents that are sitting at their kitchen table every night wondering how they're going to pay the electric bill, the gas bill, and now we want to continue this on top of that sales tax. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other discussion? Uh, Alderman Heidemann. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So... Um, if we don't support the amendment at 250, and that is voted down, that means somebody's going to make the recommendation that it goes back to five. All right, and that, and, and again, this, this is what I've been picking up. Is that is that a correct attorney? Not, we can't do that tonight. It would have to be introduced well, at a different happen. time. It's, it's correct. It's, that, I, I I kind of see what's going on here. So, um, uh, like Alderman Bourne, I like not to support the fee. But I'd rather support the 250 than rather have have some and then have somebody, I guess, possibly come back with a five in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to vote against that. So if I voted against the five in two weeks, does that mean we get rid of the fee altogether? Because that's what's going to happen. If you continue to vote down any change, yes, it would sunset. Okay. Thank you. I see no more lights. Oh, uh -uh. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you. Um, Attorney Adams, could you just clarify for me, because I'm still a little confused. If we vote down this amended resolution, why doesn't the existing resolution at $5 automatically, why isn't that in play and that extension still valid, and why couldn't, yeah, I just don't know why, You've, you've already voted on the amendment, so now you're voting on it as amended. If you vote that down, then nothing gets approved. With nothing being approved, the sunset will go into effect. At the end of the year. So there's the no, the there's no lot, there's no, so there would take a, it would take a completely new resolution. It would take a new resolution. Okay, thank you. Would the clerk please call the roll for passage? Okay, this is what you're voting on. Um, you're voting on the motion to pass the resolution as amended. Okay, everybody got it? And that is uh, three two. years and 250. Correct. Two. I'm sorry. How do I go back and change it? I guess wrong. Oh, I found it. I'm sorry, what? Oh, never mind. <coughs> is, there, is everybody in? Are you, are you okay? I think so, yeah. Eight eyes, eight no's. Motion passes. No. no I'm eight, no. sorry. Eight, eight. eight, eight. You have to break the tie. Vote? I have to break a tie. Did you just vote? No. Not yet. If it's tied, it fails, right? I'll vote nay. Yeah, he can vote the break the tie. Motion fails. Okay, hold on. Things just got interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sunsets at the end of the year. Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Okay, next we'll go to other matters. City Attorney. 
8.1 uh, is an RO from the city clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2016, June 30, 2017, and June 30, 2018. That'll be referred to the Law and Licensing Committee. 8.2 is an RO by the city clerk submitting a communication from American Family Insurance on behalf of their insured David S. and Deborah D. Aschenbach regarding a notice of claim. That'll return to the Finance Committee. Alderman Jose. So just to be clear, because the resolution failed, without further action, the, ta the uh, garbage tax will sunset at the end of the year. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay, next is a contemplated uh, closed session. Alderperson Donahue. Uh, thank you. Uh, to uh, convene in closed session pursuant to Section 1985, Sub 1, Sub E with stats for competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session for the purpose of deliberation related to a development opportunity uh, on a parcel adjacent to South Taylor Drive and Industrial Park Number 1. Second. The motion's before us. Would the clerk please call the roll for a closed session? Uh, hold on just a second. I have to take Mark off the list. Sorry. Okay, we're open for your votes. Sue, I close the thing. I. You close. You're you're an I. You're I. Mine's about an I. Pardon me. My battery died. We've been here too long. <laughs> but it's an I. <laughs> Fifteen eyes, one not present. Motion passes. We'll take a three minute recess and reconvene. Adjourn and close session.